welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. I am absolutely thrilled to have as uh, my guests today, Paul Devereaux and his wife, Charlotte Devereaux. Really, really excited to have you both here. Paul probably needs no introduction to the podcast's watchers and listeners, but he is an author, I think, of almost 30 books now, a researcher of geophysical phenomena and consciousness studies, and uh, the, the geophysical um, aspect has been, Paul's been looking at that since the 1970s. Um, Paul is a lecturer, uh, as well as an artist and photographer. He is also the co-founder and managing director of Time and Mind, the Journal of Archaeology, Consciousness and Culture. He has been a research associate at the Royal College of Art um, and a research fellow at the International Consciousness Research Lab at Princeton University and also the director of the Dragon Project. And Sharla is also an author of a number of books in the well-being area, including aromatherapy, meditation, visualization particularly, and lucid dreaming, which is really interesting. And Sharla, you also take part and probably direct, co-direct the Dragon Project too. So, and of course, you've been a researcher alongside Paul for many years now, and part of that whole research so welcome to you both hi thank you nice to be here it's really nice to have you here and um i think you know obviously the two of you have been researching these areas really interesting areas from way back and i would really love to know how you met because i think i remember (laughs) reading that was a really (laughs) you've met in a really interesting way well, I came on a tour, which I never really did before. I like to travel alone or maybe just with, with a friend. But circumstance happened, and I won't go into that long drama of it. But I ended up on a tour coming in 1984, coming over here to Britain, which was never really on my bucket list of places to go, I have to admit. And um, Paul was one of the tour guides. And basically... I mean, we obviously met at the airport. There were about 30 people. But one of the places that we went on our tour was Dartmoor, the row of some of the rows in Dartmoor. And I kind of wandered off not too far away by myself and sat down. And I was a meditator. Well, I still am a meditator. And just sat down for what I thought was a brief period of time. But anyway, when I wandered back to where everyone was, they weren't there anymore. So... uh, (laughs) Uh, not really knowing um, where I was or where we were going to be going or any of that. Anyway, I just started walking towards where I thought the the bus was. And coming across the the moor was was Paul, because they had a search party out looking for me. Obviously, they had gotten on the bus. <laughs> we had our little numbering routine and number whatever I was, never well, said anything. Missing. So, yeah, that was basically how we met. The most embarrassing part of that was getting back on the bus and everybody kind of looking and clapping and, oh, my God. (laughs) But that's basically how we met. Uh, Well, we love a bit of anarchy in Britain, so I think that would be well appreciated, you getting back on the bus late. (laughs) But, yeah, welcome to you both. I would just say that I am now retired as uh, editor of Time and Mind now. I, I mean, Paul, you know, well, you both do so much that, you know, you're still producing absolutely beautiful books as well. I've got quite a number of your books that I'm surrounded by at the moment. And um, and I used this one recently. Uh, we went off on a little adventure. Is this is this taking you back now? I know this is sort of one of the early ones. Um, I love this Very book. Early. <laughs> yeah, it's a fabulous book. It's a fabulous book. I've got this one here, which is utterly beautiful. That's a better one, yes. That's a really lovely one. Oh, I I love Late Hunters. Of course, one of the, yeah. <laughs> that one that came after the classic and this fabulous one here. I've the also ladies. got your fairy paths, which I love as well, and that helped me a lot with my research. And, you know, I've been into your research since the 90s myself. And um, when I was, you know, first beginning my project, um, you know, these are the the books that that I I turn to because I am very interested, as you are, in the energy of the landscape. So, do you think you could just introduce your research, the research that you have both been looking at over over these decades, and and where it's brought you to at the moment? 
but it, it, <laughs> it's brought me to retirement, frankly. Um, I wish I could retire. Um, I started out with lay hunting and so on, uh, and ran the Lay Hunter magazine journal uh, for quite a few years. And in the course of doing that, the idea of the sort of energy lines and all the rest of it, uh, there are energies, natural energies from the earth and from the sky for that matter. Uh, but uh, the, the the story that had developed uh, around Lay's was, and, and Alfred Watkins and so on turned out not to be true. It was a uh, a modern myth, I suppose. Uh, and uh, I had a hell of a job explaining to people that this it wasn't as we were reading it in all the all the books and papers. Uh, and you'd become sort of journalistic about ley lines and all the rest. Uh, and so I moved off into more academic areas, uh, still researching them but researching in a different way and from a different angle. Okay. And in the process, I got involved with a lot of other things like archaeoacoustics uh, and uh, the way light plays inside certain monuments uh, yes. and also the energies inside. We, we, well, I'm talking here, I'm not talking about diaphanous energies. I'm talking about uh, magnetism, uh, uh, geomagnetism uh, and radiation, which was the big surprise to me to find out that uh, rocks, certain rocks, can be radioactive. Uh, and uh, inside the Great Pyramid, uh, everywhere. Uh, and uh, it gave me a different perspective on things mm. uh, without losing, and I want to emphasize this, the numinous quality of sites. Mm. Uh, the uh, the quality, the weird, I've had strange, subtle personal experiences at sites. Uh, and uh, I remember once in uh, on Dartmoor, I'd gone out there on my own and I went to uh, a stone row, another stone row, yes. uh, deep in, in the moor. Uh, and it was a beautiful day. I put my hip flask down and set up and started photographing and looking at the site. And suddenly I got a very distinct feeling of not being welcome and of being watched. And I, I looked around and there was nothing more than clear all around. Uh, and uh, I got I got into a panic mode out of nowhere. And so I uh, I packed everything up and left my beautiful hit flask behind. I was in such a, a rush to get out of there. So I started going back, trying to get off the moor. It was two or three hour walk. And uh, this white pony appeared on the skyline, pure white. And it never came any closer than the, the skyline, but it saw me off the moor. Oh. And I really thought, ah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, better get out of here. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, so I've had that sort of experience and, and spiritual experiences. So I've not lost that side. I've just tried to focus not on a modern myth. Mm. Most of it propagated by uh, social media and, and things like that. Because mm -hmm. uh, I come from an era when there wasn't social media. But I spent the time, I did the looking, I've learned uh, and I now do these other things rather more. And also very big area of research has been anomalous light phenomena. Yes. Earth lights, as I call them. And uh, that was very important. I think is still a tremendous area of, of research that's not getting full attention at mm. all. Uh, and I've been, you know, in the Australian outback, I've been in, Hess Darlin in Norway with the light phenomena and so on and all around, really all around the Western Hemisphere. But um, so that's the area. It's been very busy, took a lot of field work, actually experiencing things, looking closely at things. Uh, and the writing is a way of keeping you going on that sort of track. 
Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's 27 books now. I'm out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it's provided so much value to, you know, researchers like myself, people that are interested in these areas and sort of following your work over the years. Mm -hmm. Um I had read about your experience there where you felt, you know, you needed to to exit fairly quickly in that that sense. I think I certainly have felt that before and and I have felt um previously that 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 um that feeling that you get uh can sometimes shift over time too if it's somewhere that you become familiar with sometimes when you first enter these places you get that response and then over time it can develop but you certainly do know that get out of here vibe when you feel it there's no mistaking but, but even with places where you're familiar with so many times uh, because of course on the dragon project we've done a lot of work at roll ride and so many times, um, usually it's wonderful when you go there, but then there are times when you know that there's something or reasons that you're just not supposed to be there. Yeah. yeah. So it can be places that you're very familiar with. Too. I, I remember a specific case of that. There was uh, one of the volunteers for the Dragon Project who was doing all night monitoring in the role, right? Uh, and uh, at that time, there was a, a little hut there. Uh, that uh, Pauline Flick, the owner at that time, yeah. uh, and had made. Uh, and I thought, I wonder how he's getting on. I, I was going nearby, and I just dropped it on my own again uh, at uh, about eleven o'clock at night, pitch dark. Went onto the into the circle, uh, and I couldn't see the guy anywhere. So I knocked on the door. Nobody there. It was locked up, uh, and. He'd done, I thought, blimey, you know, I mean, yeah. he's supposed to be doing a job here. Anyway, next day uh, I went back and he'd come back. I, I left because I felt uncomfortable. It was, again, that sense of being watched. Mm. Uh, and normally, as Charlotte says, Roe Wright's fine, you know, sunny and fine. Uh, but on this occasion, he took on a very dark feeling yeah. and I didn't feel welcome mm. uh, when I saw the guy again the next day I said where the hell were you he said well he said I, I don't like to say this but I had a very bad feeling mm. and I didn't want to stay overnight and he said I left uh, and I was quite uh, disturbed yeah so it wasn't just me it was him on completely independent experiences Absolutely. Did you have anything set up at that time that you were recording um, in that it, area? Yeah, we were doing all sorts of, really, I accounted in that last book, uh, mm. Powers of Ancient. Uh, I start really there and move, move on. Uh, we did a lot of work. We took people were talking about energies. And uh, I remember <laughs> at one stone circle, this, this Bowser guy, oh, I'm picking up an energy here, an energy line. And I looked up and there was a microwave tower on the, and I think people don't know what they're picking up. There was a really good dowser, Bill Lewis, uh, in, in, in Cornwall, uh, and he was serious about it. He actually measured on frequency meters uh, and he, he, did, he did objective findings. Mm -hmm. And he said that he said, I thought that those people who are talking about energies are picking up energies, but they don't know what they're picking up. And yeah. so it's a maelstrom of, of, of stuff going on. Uh, so, yeah. I, d I just wondered if um, at that time when you'd both experienced that, whether there was any anything that you could then look at afterwards to see if there was a shift in energies there or anything that you could pick up. Yes. Uh, sometimes the... Uh, let me think, magnetism in the stones change. Sure. Uh, and that sometimes just for an hour. Right. Sometimes for a few hours. And then would go inert for months. Yeah. And, but again, I wasn't sure whether it was heterodyning from uh, radio towers and so on. Okay. Anywhere in Britain, well, certainly anywhere in England, is covered somewhere with mm. uh, microwave radiation, radio signals, and so on. Uh, we're a very wired country, and mm. 
it happened. Uh, we didn't know why. We didn't have the resources to really follow up too much. All we were doing really was recording changes. Radiation uh, did change um, as well as magnetism. Uh, this is mainly at Royal Rhine. Yeah. Uh, because that's where we did most of the work. But we looked at other places, as I say, the King's Chamber in, in Egypt, Great Pyramid, Amazing. Uh, is radioactive. But it's radioactive because it's granite brought from yes. Aswan. Yes. Uh, but the rest of the, uh, the pyramid is, is limestone. Right. And, uh, but there was really hopping inside the King's Chamber. Uh, and various things happened there that was a bit odd. Uh, because nobody was there, it had been empty for a while, nobody was researching in there. The French were doing research work in the Queen's Chamber. Mm. Uh, and one thing that developed, uh, Mohammed was my guide, and he did not like being in the King's Chamber. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, can we keep, can we go, can we go? <laughs> and in the end, we, we came back and he said, I can't stand up very well, and my legs are going, and so were mine. Uh, they're going now for different reasons. But, <laughs> uh, they, uh, my my knees were going, and there was an old Arab where we where we exited, and uh, he offered me this little glass cup with a milky looking liquid in it. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad said, "Don't touch that." <laughs> and this bloke was so kind, old, wise looking, and I said, "Oh, come." I can't offend him. Uh, so I took it and Mohammed went on. He went, oh, and it goes up. I drink and thank the guy and, and came out. And then the shaking in my legs stopped. When I got out, <laughs> Mohammed was flat out on the sand. He couldn't stand up. Yeah. And I said, he should have drank some of that stuff, Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that that was always stuck in my mind as, as yeah. interesting. The, the idea that that he knew that there would be mm. this kind of reaction. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it would be great to. Uh, come the other place that's very radioactive, of course, is Bath. Waters are radioactive there. Uh, right, right. Well, I mean, Jersey is made of granite. It's a granite island, and all of the, um, mm -hmm. yeah, all of the dolmens on on Jersey are obviously made of granite. So a lot of quartz That's there. Right. Very, very powerful. Yeah. Have yeah. you ever been? Never been. Oh, you should come. Of it. And um, yeah, <laughs> there's so many places we want to go. Mm, We're going to the Arctic next, but that's another story. Oh, wow. uh, but the. Um, uh, yeah, and I know George Nash, uh, archaeologist, who's done a lot of work on Jersey. Right. That's yeah. not a child with strangling in the background. It's just a cat wanting to oh, get I it. Oh, <laughs> I couldn't hear it. Mine's gone out, but she'll probably come back at some point. I, I read that you'd had um, other experiences as well when you were out. I think it was on the moor when actually you felt quite um, energised from, from the landscape in a way that yeah, you weren't yeah. expecting. Incredibly. So I think it, it happened to you earlier on, many years uh, yeah, prior I... to, but certainly we were doing some work out on one of the rows, which was a fair distance again. Shovel down, road. wasn't it? Oh, Nessie, you're better with mm -hmm. remembering the names than I am. But uh, yeah, it was, we were there for a pretty long time. And, you know, usually you get a bit tired afterwards. But going back to the car, it's both both of us had the same experience of having just so much energy and and being able to walk quickly and that lasted throughout throughout the evening uh certainly you've had experience there I did, too uh, yeah prior. Uh, in, in earlier years I was with two companions who were the rugged type you know with them backpacks and they were traveling over the moor yeah. and i getting out of breath uh, and suddenly, I don't know what it was, because it's a solid block of granite, of course, uh, Dartmoor. Mm. Uh, it's a granite upland. And suddenly I uh, felt charged, and I started moving without any effort. It was weird. Experience. And I went by these two guys and went, well, and yeah. I zoomed off. Uh, and it reminded me later of a, a thing that Alexandra David Neal noticed in Tibet. Long gone. L long gone. Yeah. Uh, okay. And there they do long gone trance walking. And sometimes just above the ground. 
I wasn't above the ground, but it was uh, effortless. I could have been sitting in an armchair and I was really motoring. Mm -hmm. And that is not normal for me. And uh, it was extraordinary experience. And I think it's all to do with the energization uh, the, the the radiation gives. Mm. Uh, and I remember reading in Baron Gould's account of Dartmoor, uh, he interviewed a doctor who was the regular doctor for Dartmoor Prison. Mm. Oh, yes. And he said, you know, uh, the uh, inmates were healthier than they should have been. He said, considering the gruel, the food they had, he said they were really healthy. Yeah, very interesting. Very so interesting. There's a whole area there that needs research by medical mm -hmm. people. But of yeah. course, they won't look at that. Yeah, I mean, I know very little about this, but in terms of, you know, us as human beings, we are, I understand, electromagnetic beings and you know these we are interacting interacting with everything around us and mm -hmm. I'm sure you Sharla uh, know more about this than me as well about you know how we are affected how our energy centers um, that you know some people call them chakras how that land could then potentially um, bring us into balance in some way in our own energy body do you think that's what happened there I mean I don't know well, quite possibly. You know, we lived in Cornwall for a while in Penzance, and we lived in uh, a house was uh, a lot of the walls in the house were granite. And of course, the thing is, in the old houses, too, even though you might have your window shut, there's still air seeping through all yeah. the time, which in a way is really good because the problems occurred when people started putting in um, central heating and things like that and having windows that were so really uh sealed up in in a way so you didn't have that that airflow and it wasn't as healthy we used to, we had to have monitors put on the that's wall. right because the granite would be concentrated mm -hmm. in a way that it wasn't when you had the the airflow so definitely the environment is going to make a difference and yes as you say i mean we're we're beings of the planet and so of course we're going to be interacting and also sort of cosmic radiation uh causes northern lights and things and yeah. you see that and uh, i remember one account given of uh, a very powerful aurora display over i think was it the shetland islands or one of the northern islands and the the guy the writer said weird things happened during this strong display mm. uh that crockery would split in half uh door latches would move like poltergeist yeah and he said it was an extraordinary thing and uh and when the the lights the cosmic radiation eased off a bit uh then these phenomena stopped happening so Isn't there's they? a full range of stuff mm. yeah it sounds very intense i can imagine now so, sorry the more we did the less yeah. we know so it's a, an old adage but it was true absolutely but... no it's so true isn't it it really is mm -hmm. it just it just you know uh brings more questions to the surface and other rabbit holes to go down really doesn't it and it's, um it's true. yeah now i know one thing in common that we have also is that uh you had had a first-hand experience mm -hmm. and together which makes it really interesting. Um, so this is a, a multiple witness sighting. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little about that, please? Because you were on a research trip in Ireland, weren't you, together? And this was back in, was it the um, 2000, 2009 or something? Let me unpack that, because yeah. the book that we were researching, field researching for, was Fairy Paths mm -hmm. and Death Roads, whatever is it called. Yes. 2003 that came out right and i gotta tell you i can't write, quite remember the exact date we had our okay. encounter mm -hmm. uh but it would have been about 2000 the year 2000 or 1999 because we did two lots of mm -hmm. field research for the book in ireland we did a lot of other places as well uh, and what we had done initially uh we went to university college dublin because they've got a record of all the uh uh, it was called, the, at least one way it was called, was the school project yeah. where where universities sent out packs or whatever 
to uh, schools and asking the kids to talk to the oldest members of their family. And this is in the 1930s. Amazing. Uh, and uh, and when, he, when they gave back their stories from the old granddad or grandma or whoever, they, uh, they collated them <clears throat> and picked out the more interesting looking ones and sent them out and recorded them on phonographs and so on. Uh, and uh, we went to over a million sheets of paper in their records, a lot to it in Gaelic. Yeah. Um, all we wanted to know was what they were, were they saying back then about fairy paths? Because the, the, the theme of the book was to be, and it was, um, the idea of spirit waves through the landscape. Uh, all sorts, different types, everything from dream time tracks and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we collected what we could, and it was infuriatingly vague, a lot of them. <laughs> People say, oh, well, there was a fairy path there, you know. Oh, where's it start? Where's it end? You know. Anyway, so we collected quite a bit. We had a, a couple, did we, from translated from Gaelic, Morris. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we tried to get this is raw verbatim, verbatim um, um, accounts of the law to do with fairies. We had a lot of help from the uh, Irish storyteller Eddie Lenahan, and he uh, came with us on a number of the trips. Yeah. Uh, and right. a whole range of stuff, and I go into it in fairy paths and spirit roads. Uh, and oh, what is the spirit? Road? You've got the box there. I you? do have. And the actually, book. there it's were two different versions, unless it's different titles. Yeah. Yeah. It might actually be down here. Yeah. yeah, because the later one you changed the name, didn't you? They did. Yeah, yeah the published oh, they did. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so um, you don't have much control once your book gets out in the hands of these people. Anyway, another story. So armed with this information, we started going around places where there was believed to have been fairy paths. And we tried to actually track them geographically as far as you could. Yeah. It was fascinating. And we heard stories from people, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes quite remote farmsteads upon on Kerry Hills and so on. And the lovely people, really yes. lovely people. Yeah. But some of the accounts they told us were sort of generic fairy tales. Uh, a few were experiences. These were they were recounting things they remembered, encounters, and they were of a different tone altogether. Mm -hmm to uh, the generic fairy stories. Uh, like on your your podcasts, you know, these are sure. real experiences and they don't fit the neat idea of what a fairy should be. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that was good. And so on this occasion, uh, we'd already got a hint uh, that these things could be real. There was a woman who saw uh, I, that's another story. Mm -hmm. But these were just hints we got during the field work. And on this occasion, we were travelling from uh, Clare to County Mayo. And I damn well don't know quite where it was, but it, we were on a country road. It was overcast, mid-afternoon. And I was driving along and uh, the narrow little country lane. And we came to a junction, road junction, and it was a wide junction. I think good old island, at least back then, uh, you didn't always get a signpost. Um, which way do we go now? Do we get this Cluna, I think it was, where the, in Mayo, where old Bill's house, remember? Mm, I remember. Uh, anyway, house, yeah. So uh, that's where we were going. That's where we had this account from, from the folklore. Uh, and didn't know really which way to go. And so you try and visualize this. The road is going in a wire like this. In between the two roads was low grass. And the background, about, I don't know, 100 yards, was a uh, stand of trees. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to go, well, I decided wandering, with walking speed now mm -hmm. in the car. Yeah. And going, going to uh, the right path. Mm -hmm. 
And just as we started to do that, this thing appeared on the grass. Uh, and we both saw it once, didn't we? Yeah, that was the freaky bit. Uh, and it was really towards the verge, yeah, uh, closer grow. to the verge than in back right. to the, the grass. And it was just one of those um, things where I've seen things in the past, I have to say, when we've been coming home late at night from London or whatever. And, you know, chalk it up. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, could be imagination, whatever. But uh, so I, I was used to that. But what freaked me was as I was looking at this, Paul said something too. And it was this realization that for me anyway, that he that he saw it as well. And so yeah. that kind of put it into a I didn't hung around, place. I say for a while, but it, we were to be more. No, we were still traveling. Yeah, yeah but very slow. Mm -hmm. But that, that, what that did was as we moved, you could see it was fully three dimensional. It's yes. about three foot tall, mm. two and a half, yeah, about three foot. Mm. Uh, and it was, we have since described like a bollard yeah. with head and shoulders. Uh, and it was just covered everywhere, all over, with a tight green uh, texture, like like tight foliage. Mm. I don't want to say it was foliage, but it looked like it. Mm. And it was all over this thing. Uh, I couldn't see arms and legs. We checked no. each of us. That's why the baller shaped. There were, it, wasn't, it could have been a thing standing But you like, couldn't really tell. We couldn't tell. Yeah. Mm. And, and as we went slowly around, like absolutely shocked, because you've got no reference for something like this, of course. Uh, yeah. uh, it started to turn to look at us. It gave me the creeps. <laughs> Uh, and you saw eyes, didn't you? I saw eyes following us, mm -hmm. and it it was just so freaky. Uh, but it didn't it didn't scare me or anything. I was it was just trying to compute it in my, yeah. my head, really. The eyes yeah. were dark in set, and then I saw all this stuff, and then it just went, it wasn't there anymore. And you know, in on movies and that things appear in the. This just was not there first, and then it yeah. was, and then suddenly it wasn't. Uh, and obviously we pulled up a few moments. You said, what did you say when it went like that? Well, when I realised, uh, well, I won't say what I said, yes, but anyway. <laughs> Express shock, let's put it Yeah. And I had an experience, and it turns out that Charlotte did not that uh, I just felt the thing was full of foreboding. Okay. I didn't like it at all. Uh, I, What I should have done, hey, I'm the writer, I told Deborah I'm going to do <laughs> things. I, I was scared, I'll be quite honest. And I just didn't like the feel of this thing. I should have stopped, got out and walked over to the spot, see, mm -hmm. contrary it up again or whatever it was. Not lightly, I didn't want to be anywhere near that thing. Uh, and maybe it was the Irish in me, I don't know. Uh, and in fact, uh, since I'd figured out what that was, because then we shot off, I put the, my foot down on accelerator and we got out of there. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I think my reaction was, was if the background to what I was thinking was the people, cultures have folklore and traditions and so on, and the fairy law was based on that sort of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> but we had just been getting the inkling on this particular field trip that there was more to it that people were describing, as I said, memories. Yes. And I thought, well, what did I think? I didn't, I still had to get out. You've always got to get out uh, of, of these things as long as you don't see them. Exactly. Well, when you see them, as you know, as we certainly mm. know now, uh, there's nowhere else to go. It happened. It's there. It you, was there. Or was there. Mm. But it was a real, transient, but concrete, objective experience. And this is what uh, gets you tell people. And, the, and a lot of them don't believe it. Certainly more academically minded people we've spoken to about it. And what I realized, they're doing what I was doing. I'd assumed 
there was the alternative that it was the mind or something uh, and yeah. it's it, not it's it, it's it's really uh, there it's really happening and you can't escape from that fact and it's a form of intellectual escapism to not believe this stuff i think uh, in the academe and the academic world and various others i mean people who know us who get on and i think they're tolerating us when we talk about this which is not that often i've only started going on about it in recent years uh and I think that's what was happening to me. I was trying to adjust to the fact that I can't get out of this. This is a real thing, uh, not not just some diaphanous idea or a folklore, not a folklore. But well, but the thing is, I mean, I I was just shocked that we both saw the same thing, to be quite honest. And that's what was going through my mind and thinking, you know, of other things. It didn't frighten me. I I wasn't running to to get it and i mean obviously paul was driving so but um but equally i should have said let's start let's go back let's just look mm -hmm. and i never did it never dawned on me nice. to because my head was just in in a different in a different place and of course we both very much regretted uh that for different <coughs> reasons yeah and to, not, to, going and back. to not even record where this yeah why thing was exactly junction but, that, but that's the thing. I mean, I think when when people hear when when you have had these experiences, if if you thought that something like that was going to happen, and and I was the same as you, I thought this was impossible as well. And when people talk to me about having seen things, well, one woman did, um, and I knew she was being serious. I could not get my head around it, and I I didn't think it was possible either. So I, you know, you can see where people are coming from when they just can't get their heads around it because it just blows everything out of the water, really, doesn't it? Everything that we thought we knew about the world. And the thing is, you'd think, oh, some people say, if I saw a fairy, I would do this and I would do that. But it's not like that. When it happens, the way that you think that you would respond, you you just don't respond that way. You know, you don't um, take a note of the place or you don't, oh, you've, uh, the video stalled there a little. Ah, oh, you're back, you're back, you're back. Yeah, it's just not how you would expect uh, things to uh, to turn out. But do you think that your research then took a turn after that? Ontological shock is what it is. Yes. Yes and no. Uh, I was all, all very open to stuff and I was researching what I was researching. The acoustics was fairly clear of this sort of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. Uh, the, the study of sound at ancient sites, but uh, it's not weird. It's not woo woo in the way that damn thing was. Mm. Uh, and, um, so mostly it didn't affect me personally too much, except there's knowledge I now have. There's something going on in this world, in this reality, even yeah. if only visits it occasionally, um, that we don't know about. And you can't get people to know about it. You can't get universities or, or anybody to really search. Oh, you've just broken up a little bit there. It into a world picture. You we were don't just quite have. Frozen. You froze. Now, yeah, now you now. froze yeah. a little bit. Did I freeze as well for you? Um, just just, you were just, just momentarily. OK, you were just saying that you can't get universities to to look at it. Not seriously. You can get no. individuals and you get little groups of individuals. Yeah. But it's not a, it's not um, a cultural reassessment of things. And also what the secret they're, they're telling us, these things, the expressing Mm -hmm. uh, that we don't know, that we are ignorant of, and God knows what it might open up. Mm, exactly. What it also does, and what made me aware, that the concern we have with ecological matters yes. now, and climate mm. change and all the rest, yeah. these things are in it. Yeah. and uh, So are we, we just uh, yeah. have never really Absolutely. acknowledged it that but way. The, these are, these are our companions, as it were, and we know nothing about officially. 
in, in an open sense. And it, it's frustrating and it annoys me. I'm sorry, it annoys the hell out of me that these things aren't properly studied at a real cultural level mm -hmm. uh, because there's stuff there we need to know and we need to know quick, mm -hmm. I think. I think part of the problem, too, with that is that you also get a lot of people on a bandwagon who hear a couple of things and suddenly they go into things and start um, putting information out that's coming from them and not really from the reality of, of what might be going on for whatever reason they, they might have to do that, whether they want to become popular or, or for whatever reason. And of course, that then puts a lot of this in in not it's a very good light. Yeah, it dilutes. Which is a shame. It dilutes in fact. If you go on YouTube and look at videos of fairies, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable the number of videos on there. It's absolute rubbish most of I it. Know. I've really I gone know. through it. Maybe the two I've seen that look like the catching. And yeah. this is something we're working on in the Dragon Project. In that so far. But entities generally we're looking at, you know, mm -hmm. as a lot of people mm -hmm. are now, it's becoming quite popular. Uh, and are these things really out there? Are they in the, A lot of people say it's, it's a mental thing. Well, it may be partially, but this thing was on the grass. It was three-dimensional and we could drive around it looking like that. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's not good enough to come mm. up with it. And that is a way of intellectual escapism, I think. To just have the door problem. closed and not and not look at it. This is the trouble. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even for myself, this summer I had quite um, an eye opener because uh, with my experience, and the same as you, um, Charlo, you're sort of looking at it and just amazed and I mm -hmm. guess possibly sort of just processing what was happening, but not not um, frightened. It was it mm -hmm. was lovely. But uh, and he looked very different. I mean, yours sound, yours sounds as if it was, um, you know, a bit more weird to look at. Whereas I was looking at an open face that was, and I say open because yeah. he just had lovely. You said what was interesting me about your account though was it very lined face. Oh yeah, lined. just ancient, ancient, ancient skin. Mm -hmm. Just there was no flat skin. It was just all completely you know, wrinkled, but he still had a, he had a lovely face, nice little cheeks mm. and, you know, twinkly eyes. Um, but um, where was I going with that? Yes. So, you know, it was something that I saw, though I was with my husband, he didn't see it, although he was looking the other way. It was me that had turned around, perhaps because it was already looking at me and I had a sense to sort of to look. But um I went back to that location this summer and chatted with a woman. I just released this last week, actually. Um, she saw a being that sounds, it sounds like the being I saw. And she saw it at the same place. About That's, That is interesting. Yeah, it is interesting because, mm. okay, you know, a lot of the time we're working with these theories that whatever it is, um, we, you know, we meet the divine, if you want to call it in that in some way. And then we are bringing up all of our knowledge, beliefs, experiences, and we are turning that into something that we can then process. That's what the theory says. But of course, for yourselves, you wouldn't have been expecting seeing some to, to see something no. like that. Although I suppose, sorry, carry on. You no, know, I was just going to say, and and then for me and this woman to see exactly the same, the mm -hmm. way she described it was the same being as I saw That's on different occasions. Yeah, you know, it's a so... valid occasion, yeah. A lot of people mm -hmm. say, well, what were you doing? You were searching fairy paths for your book. So you were primed. And, and they escape into that. Yeah. Well, it's true, we were. But we were looking for anything then. I just found trying to find the way, you know. This and, is it. Uh, and then when it appeared, it's quite different. Exactly. Uh, and uh, another example, yeah. we're tr following this this fairy path, uh, as was, because we map mapped them on once we got the accounts from these uh, the these papers in the that's the cat. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't like closed doors when he's on the other side of them. Yeah. And he's got something if we to let say. him in, he'll go he'll go mad. Just sit um, on the keyboard. <laughs> uh, yeah, so on this occasion we there was a, a, a 
what they call a fairy fort in Ireland, a rath. And it went, this path went through an ancient crossroads that had traditions. And on its way, it cut through the end of a little farmstead, the very end. And when we got there, the guy was out and they were building a new extension on, but the old part was still there. And we, we said, you know, has anybody had any experiences in this place? He said, well, my wife has. We were now separated, weren't they? Mm -hmm. My wife has, but um, I think it's because she was poorly. She's not very well. Um, anyway, she lives down in the village now, and uh, uh, I've never seen anything. We found her. We found the place, mm -hmm. and we spoke to her, and she was quite open about it. She said, yeah. She said, I got up about three in the morning. I wasn't feeling very well. But she said, suddenly, uh, while she was sitting there, these small figures came in through one wall, went straight across the end of the room, which was the end of this building, exactly where our line had gone mm -hmm. on, and out through the other side. Didn't pay any attention to her. And she told her husband, and he said, oh, it's because you're having an hallucination or something. And that's how these things get sure. become palatable exactly. for people. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, that was before we had our experience. And that right. started with like, oh, these people are seeing things. Right. Somebody else had uh, a contact. That priest guy who, who said he had seen the gentry Okay. Where the tall figures, yeah, and the dark crossed the road ages ago, and I asked one of the one of our people in the countryside, country folk. Well, this is for our experience again. Oh, why, yeah. why don't we uh, see fairies and things? And he said, two reasons: you don't walk across the countryside enough. You're going by too fast in your cars, and you're not thing he said i know i think he actually pointed to a field there was a track across that we used to go along can't even see it now right. he said so you're not in the contact that we had in those days mm -hmm. my father being irish he used to walk miles between places if they went for a game of cards you know they'd all walk over the fields and whatever uh in the dark late at night after a few but um we don't it's true we don't have, and my other sense i got uh you were talking earlier prior, prior to this mm -hmm. uh about whether we, if we had noticed if the phenomena was getting more i think yeah. it's getting less really uh, yeah i mean uh, things were happening much more Th this experience we're talking to you about now i don't know about you but it was my last really strong weird anomalous experience mm -hmm. i'm talking 20 years and my sense is i had this earlier that i think the fairies whatever these entities are uh, and i don't think they're what they appear but anyway that's another story uh i think they've been moving away from areas of urbanization and that's why ireland on the very edge of the atlantic that area is a good place. It's sort of congregated to some extent there, mm. I think. <coughs> and and uh, so that's my sense. Uh, and I think this invisible country of theirs is slowly disappearing. And I think it's disappearing with the decline of the ecological environment. This type of there are other things happening but yeah. do you think that that's why they do you think that's why we're having these experiences i mean put it this way if i hadn't seen what i had seen i probably wouldn't be doing this now i mean i hadn't right. intended to do anything like this it was through a series of you know it's, it's always coincidences isn't it i went to um university of bristol to study ritual in the landscape and actually it was Ronald Hutton with no idea of my experience. I hadn't mentioned it to him. It was him that said, why don't you look at medieval Irish fairies? Then joined the Folklore Society, got asked to write a book about fairies. Again, not, not something that I was uh, 
you know, looking to, and, and now here I am doing this, it's, it's, and, and talking to people about it. So, you know, hopefully that people feel it's okay to talk about it. Same as yourself, you have come, you've got an incredible, uh, you know, lot of research um, throughout your career. You've come at it from an entirely um, academic perspective, albeit extremely open-minded and pioneering. Um, and then you've come and had and had this experience and now you are talking about it do you think that this is no coincidence and the reason that we have had these experiences is so that we can get people maybe talking about this again and actually taking it seriously do you think that might be an aspect of why we had those experiences in the first place because I certainly didn't understand why I did back then I don't, yeah, so. I don't necessarily think so. I think, <clears throat> uh, again, my, just my own feeling, that people have these experiences, those that have these experiences are somehow in some way open to them, whether, not that they're necessarily going, to, because we certainly weren't going to, to um, even think that we experience something like that no. but that there's some kind of openness that whatever the these things are, um, to put it in human terms, they feel comfortable with with exposing themselves, right? Which they wouldn't necessarily to the general public, and and unfortunately, things are going in such a way. I mean, with climate change denial and everything that goes along with that, uh, that I don't think those would be the the type of people that would have these kind of experiences. <laughs> you see what I mean? Well, they want to put themselves in situations where they might well, see them. Too. Yes, but even if they did. But I don't think it's purposeful in quite that way. Yeah. The thing. I think it's, I mean, I'm, I, I have to face the fact for 20 years or thereabouts, 15 years or so, I didn't talk about it. I only barely mentioned it in the fairy parts mm. book, uh, just in passing. Uh, and I, it's only in the, the last few years I feel I really want to talk about this. Yeah. And woe betide anybody who doesn't believe me. <laughs> I <laughs> want to. <laughs> I just want to get this out there, yeah. put it on the table, uh, one of many uh, quite authentic accounts of actual encounters. And it, 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 it. I just feel a need to do it personally now that I didn't quite have that push to do uh, earlier on uh, and I think in that sense it has changed me a little bit uh, but also I'm half Irish and I shoot my mouth off so it's one of those things. <laughs> Maybe that's where I get it from then as well being uh, my dad being Irish and my mother's. Oh is that right? Yeah. Oh yeah dad's from Cork um, and the and the our family must go right back because Hickey is an old Irish name which interestingly means right. healer. Which ah, is, that is interesting. Yeah, it, it, we were the apparently the healers to the kings of Munster. So I do think it's interesting you saying about uh, these fairy beings or whatever whatever they are, um, you know, moving away from from centres maybe in say Britain and and being more in places like Ireland and I guess you could count places like Cornwall and the southwest of a lot of the southwest of England and perhaps even places like Scotland, you know, mm -hmm. where the folklore has always been really strong and continued. Um, anyway, yeah. So what do you think? Do you think that that is the message then? That it's it's. Do you think there is a message? And if so, you think that that's an an you know an ecological wake up call for people. I think it's just something that's happening. I don't think yeah. anybody anywhere or anything anywhere is putting a message out. Okay. Uh, I think it's just something. If anything, we're picking up that there's a message here. If you like, I don't think so. I don't think of that gets to to my mind a little bit like a divinity thing is some somebody has a purpose everybody thinks they've got a purpose we might not have any purposes at all mm. you don't want to think that but who knows uh i don't think it's in that sense so directly that but i think there's a reaction going on um it's it's the last chance saloon that's what i think yeah. uh and in that sense i suppose there's a message but uh not in in that concrete sense of their yeah. being, uh, you know. Uh, we need to find out what they are, why they are, uh, 
and, and what it might mean for the world. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's something here that needs explication in, a, in an open way uh, and before it's too late, in my view, my humble view. Well, yeah, thank you very much. And of course, um, I had read about your experience in the foreword to Jack Hunter's Greening the Paranormal, which is a great book if people are interested, to look at our relationship with the environment in, in a new way and, and how important that is. So, um, and where can, yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, where can people get hold of your books? And more about so and and Sharla as well and what your I'm not sure whether you do any workshops or anything like that Sharla but let us know how you can both um, how people can get hold of your books and your work and research. Well, my last book is available uh, online with Amazon or any of the other online booksellers. Yeah, that that one? One, that's readily available. Great. Book. Some of the others have been around so long uh, that the earlier books are out of print. You know. Um, and now people are not reading yeah. books anyway. They everything's on screen. I think people like to still have books. I love having books. I don't know anyone know, that doesn't absolutely. like having books. It, it, I tell you, it's just the, the tailors yeah. who, who work uh, uh, as field researchers on this on the Dragon Project. They're moving house at the moment, and it's a bad time to be moving house. Trying to, and they're going around lots of houses. You know. See if they want to buy them. Oh, yeah. And they're looking around, and the thing that struck struck them: people don't have bookshelves anymore. They're, they're devoid of books. Uh, and people read journal magazines and things like that. But there's or online ebooks and things. I mean, you come in our house, and every room has books. Mm. Too many. Yeah. Yeah. Literally too many. That's right. <laughs> and and uh, I'm talking to Bob Ricard. <clears throat> Uh, the other week, Fortune Times. Fortune Times founder, editor in, in in the day. And he said, nobody's reading books anymore. And he said, he's collecting it up and he's boxing his up and going to an archive, unfortunately, in Sweden, because he couldn't find the equivalent. Because, you know, at a certain age, you think, what are we going to do with our libraries and things? Yeah. Uh, you haven't got to that yet, but you will. Um, and the which I will tell you, which is inevitable. Uh, and he says, uh, these books, he said, are like fossils now. He said, and that, that's why they have to be recorded. People will always read books, but it's not uh, a cultural, common cultural thing anymore. Uh, it, and if they are, it's some sort of pulp fiction thing, you know, uh, for holidays, perhaps. A book to read on the beach, so paperback, get by in the airport or something the majority of people of course obviously there oh. are those that are dedicated and and into research and things but talking about the the wider general, uh, general, general cultural population thing. yeah uh and uh, yeah. It, let's say it's not gone but it's it's getting there and um it's declining That's because so of all the you know there's electronic books and all the rest of it yeah, but I mean, you have to have an electronic device to access them. It just makes accessibility mm. so much less, doesn't it? You know, we need we need books. We need physical. And they're just There's something items. very important about about having a physical book and, yeah. and uh, the smell of it, the feel of it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And they hold uh, memories. Yeah, you know? yeah, and, absolutely. And uh, also, book knowledge is a deeper, more rounded knowledge that you get. Rather than the flash past splitting, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a different level. It is. So I think just the media landscape has changed so much. Uh, people don't have a lot of time. Uh, they're working hard, uh, and books, book reading as per se, book reading is tending to decline, which is very sad. Yeah, I really. I hope there's a, you know, a resurge in, um, in uh, interest because, I mean, even my, my child, well, my little one, my youngest one, she loves her books. She's got books everywhere and loves reading through them. So hopefully 
the next generations will um still hold books in high regard physical books because the thing is if you're if you're reading in bed the the backlight i mean i don't have any any devices to read in bed but um yeah. aside from your phone which is a really bad habit but it but reading from a book in bed just helps your eyes relax and then it yes, takes it you into such a lovely sleep yeah. very different to looking at uh, a kind of a screen well you use different parts of your brain you know uh, a book a page holding this book whatever and something that yes beams into your eyes is a yeah. different experience just up here so. Mm -hmm. But people can um, connect with your books, can buy your books on. Don't you have a website that people can buy yeah. them from directly? Uh, yes. Uh, what we found, though, with foreign speak uh, readers, mm -hmm. uh, pe people abroad, the cost of posting things yeah. now. We've actually, Paul has a website, and yes, all of the, the books that are currently in print are, are available on that but it is true we've actually put up a notice on the website because of course now with the brexit and we won't go there yeah. uh but the the cost that people are having to pay on duty for books going to france you know germany yeah. um and forget about the states so we have put on a thing saying look you can get books his books from um any reputable we're not fans of Amazon, but the point is that they can get they them from them. there and they're not yeah. going to be charged yeah. these crazy prices because That's they have right. places within the countries. Yeah, the, the website is uh, is uh, pauldevro.co.uk. Lovely. I'll flash that up. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Abe Books is really good as well. I always try and look yes, at Abe. Abe. Yeah. Well, you see, they've actually been bought by Amazon. Oh, you're kidding. No. <laughs> Oh, for goodness sake, then where is there to go? Well, they still seem it's to have their own sacred. Of integrity. As far as <laughs> that, I can say. That's the problem, isn't it? It's, yeah. Uh, Conglomerates. Uh, but, yeah, A books, uh, all those sort of books you can get online and should have that last one, perhaps a few of the others. I don't know. Uh, how about yours? Are yours? Uh... Oh, mine's the same thing there. They're available online or through paul's website uh the only yeah. difference obviously on paul's website the books get signed because we send them from, yes. from here yes, but so um yeah but otherwise well. i mean from a cost perspective uh it's it's really ridiculous unfortunately yes, and you know your books Sharla. this is what we need right now when the world has just gone completely crazy and we need meditation <laughs> and visualization and yeah. an aromatherapy amazing for bath times and you know mental health emotional health well-being all of that need that absolutely big yeah, time. absolutely people need to slow down and that's part of what it's about yeah. and by slowing down you get more inward and it's wonderful to do the slowing down out in nature too because then you're connecting and letting yourself open in a in a in a different way i mean your right. your last book uh has all sorts of nature related yeah. meditations and oh, visualizations and so on. Mm. Yeah, and it's come full circle because that's how you met, you know? Well, that's true. Meditating outside can lead you to your soulmate. All kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> and all kinds now of we're adventures older and wiser. <laughs> Theoretically, Theoretically. Anyway. older parts, true. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful to speak to you both. I really appreciate Very you joining enjoyable. me. Thank you, really thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.